Welcome to The Analytic Christian. I'm Jordan, and this is the channel that helps you explore Christian philosophy and theology. My guest today is Dr. Andrew Moon. Hey, Andrew. Hello, Jordan. Good to see you again. Yeah. This may be your eighth, ninth time on. I'm not really sure now, but you've been on a lot, and I love it. I'm always excited when you're on. We're going to be talking about a topic that I've been wanting to discuss for a long time, the evolutionary argument against naturalism. And this is a good time because you are, I guess you just finished up this paper on right. this argument, right? Or at least topics very closely related to this argument. That's right. Yep. What volume is that paper coming out in? Uh, it's a volume called Evolutionary Debunking Arguments. It, uh, it's going to be published by Routledge. And so there's a lot of uh, entries, evolutionary debunking arguments against morality, against religion, against math i think if i remember um so yeah mine's in the epistemology section as not surprising so yep okay well let's let's jump in because we have a lot of ground to cover yeah first of all just how did you get interested in the evolutionary argument against naturalism yeah so let's see um i went to the ohio state university uh and so maybe around at 2000, around 2002, 2003, that's when I first learned about this argument. I was generally reading a lot of uh, work by Alvin Plantinga, who first gave this argument. And, um, you know, Plantinga's a really good writer. Um, he's fun to read. Uh, and I was just really interested in um, what he had to say about this argument. So, yeah, and I'm also an epistemologist, and this argument is an epistemological argument. So, that's what first got me interested. But um, as you just said, uh, recently I've had to look, go back and look into the literature on um, the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Um, why don't we just call it EAAN, evolutionary yeah. argument against naturalism? So, um, yeah, the, the paper I wrote is on global debunking arguments. So, a global debunking argument is a debunking argument, it debunks all your beliefs. And the EAAN is supposed to be a global debunking argument. So while I was writing this paper on global debunking arguments, I ended up having to do a lot of reading on EAAN. And in the process, while writing the paper, I just started responding to objections to EAAN. And so um, that's why the literature is pretty fresh in my uh, memory right now. And so I'm happy to do an interview on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What is the EAAN? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, maybe I'll start with kind of like the big picture, um, like lay of the land. So just kind of a, like the forest view. Um, so this argument it's defended by and formulated by Alvin Plantinga. So it's good to start thinking about a, a contrasting like view. So uh, suppose you're a theist. You believe in God and that God created humans in his image. Then you'll think your brain and your uh, your brain was designed so that you can have knowledge about the world. And you don't have to have a specific view about how God did this. You might think God did it in six days or through a long period of evolution. Uh, the point is that you think your brain and its mechanisms, your cognitive faculties, were created by God so that you can know truths about the world. Okay, so... That's not the evolutionary uh, argument against naturalism. That's just to get you thinking, okay, about a contrast. So here's how it would apply. Here's the actual evolutionary argument against naturalism. So suppose you're a naturalist. Then you won't think that God designed your brain or your cognitive faculties. Uh, you should think that humans came to exist by a purely naturalistic evolutionary process. Okay, how likely is it, would it be then that your brain would be well designed to form true beliefs and knowledge about the world? But planning to argue that this would be unlikely. And if he's right, then you should think it's unlikely that your cognitive faculties can reliably form true beliefs about the world. And if that's right, then the naturalist should no longer trust that his brain is reliable. And hence, the naturalist shouldn't trust any of his beliefs, including his belief in naturalism. Hence, the naturalist who considers planning his argument should not continue to hold his belief in naturalism. So that's the sense in which, uh, if this argument works, uh, belief in naturalism is self-defeating, at least for the naturalist who is considering this sort of argument. 
I think it will help if we get into the specific premises and conclusion. So let's go ahead and shift to that, the actual argument. I'm going to put up the slides that we've made. Great. Okay. So yeah, that, that was just like kind of the forest presentation just to give viewers an idea of what EAAN is about. So yeah, let's just talk through this. Um, so first we have to learn some of our terminology. So N stands for naturalism, the view that there are no supernatural beings, beings like God, angels, souls, the force from Star Wars. Uh, e stands for evolution, and here we'll use E to stand for this thesis, that humans came to exist in the ways described by contemporary evolution. And R is the proposition that human cognitive faculties are generally reliable. Okay, so let's just talk about these uh, terms a little bit. Um, so in uh, R, uh, the, the right there, right there, uh, yeah. R, uh, mentions our cognitive faculties, and that's kind of the mechanisms of our brain. So um, there are methods or abilities or way of knowing about the world. So it'll include things like perception, memory, reason, uh, introspection. So these are all things we use to gain knowledge. And so what R says is that uh, human cognitive faculties are generally reliable. Uh, by reliable, we mean uh, they form mostly true beliefs over false beliefs. Uh, it's important to note that when we say cognitive faculties are reliable, we're not saying that they're 100% perfect. Uh, sometimes we form false beliefs. Um, I get things, we get things wrong once in a while, but take just my perception, one cognitive faculty. Um, like it's going to give me true beliefs about whether I have hands, that I have five fingers, the size of my computer, uh, the color of my computer, uh, things like that. So what do we mean by our faculties being reliable or let's say my vision being reliable is it's giving me mostly true beliefs, uh, even if not 100% of the time. Yeah. Okay, so that's the um, that's our background terms. I think there's a ne the next slide. We'll yeah, this is the actual that. argument. The reason we had to define those terms is yeah. premise one just looks like gibberish unless <laughs> you know what those terms actually mean. So now right. that we know what in N is for naturalism, E is for evolution, and R okay. is for reliable cognitive faculties. Yeah. The thesis that our cognitive faculties are reliable. Good. So what's that uh, that P mean? So uh, this is kind of philosophical terminology. And um, pro so that P1, premise one, is saying that uh, the probability, that's the P, the probability that R, that our cognitive faculties are reliable, given, so the slash means given, so given naturalism and evolution is low. Okay, so the probability that our Faculties are reliable given naturalism and evolution is low. Okay, that's premise one. So let's just think through these. Premise two, anyone who accepts or believes NNE and also sees that the probability of R given NNE is low has a defeater for R. Anyone who has a defeater for R has a defeater for any other belief she thinks she has, including NNE itself. Uh, premise four, if one who accepts NNE thereby acquires a defeater for NNE, then NNE is self-defeating and can't rationally be accepted. So conclusion, NNE can't rationally be accepted. Uh, this argument is taken word for word out of um, uh, one of planning his books here, which uh, I'll refer to in a bit. But um, actually, I'll refer to it right now, according to my notes. So uh, something to note. So I just kind of read the argument. Hopefully, the, um, the viewers are kind of looking at it, letting it digest. Um, something just to say about EAAN is... Um, it first appears in 1993 in this book, Warranted, uh, Warranted Proper Function by Alvin Plantinga. It's kind of the focus of chapter 12. 1993, that's almost 30 years ago. I can't believe it. Um, the argument continues to get updates, this argument, E-A-A-N, um, throughout like 1994, goes through big revision, 95, 96. Uh, but the next big revision comes in 2002 in this book, Naturalism Defeated. And this book is edited by James Bealby, whom, Jordan, you've interviewed. And you get just a whole bunch of philosophers responding to EAAN. Like, the, the whole book is just chapters of people responding to this argument. And then Planning replies to them all at the end. That's 2002. And then 2009, Planning devotes a chapter of, sorry, 2011, 
planning it devotes a chapter of this book to this argument. So I just thought it, I just wanted to give a quick history of this argument. Um, yeah. You guys know where it's coming yeah, from. Yeah, that's helpful. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to unpack planning as defense of each premise now. Uh -huh. uh, but before we do, Justin Mooney is watching and he asked a good question. He asked, what kind of probability is being used here? Yeah. Epistemic. Uh, so, yeah, what is it? Yeah, so some people won't know about different types of probability. Um, planning it intends to be for these to be what are called objective probabilities. So just um, so the probabilities are true independent of us. Just how likely would it be, given naturalism evolution, that we would have reliable cognitive faculties? There's a place though where planning a uh, considers whether these could be epistemic probabilities, and um, he thinks the argument could work there too. Um, this will, I don't want to go too much into a tangent, but there's a paper by, I think, um, Perry Hendricks. Uh, there's a discussion between Perry Hendricks and somebody else about whether you can actually use objective probabilities here. But I think that would take us too far astray from this discussion. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good question, Justin. Okay. So let's get into the actual premises, like the defense for each one. So uh -huh. premise one there is going to be a major premise in the argument. That's right. Uh, so how does planning it defend that premise? Okay, so um, probably the defense of premise one has gone the the mo undergone the most revision. Uh, the probability that are are that our faculties are reliable given naturalism and evolution is low. So you need a bunch of terminology uh, to get the argument down. So uh, let's just talk through these. Or I'll just read through them. Um, Materialism is the view that the mind is a physical thing. Uh, mental properties will be thing, properties of the mind, um, properties like having a belief, desires, feelings, thoughts, intentions, pains, pleasures. Those are all mental properties. Um, the important one we're going to care about are beliefs. Um, okay. And then there's what we'll call content properties. And we're specifically thinking about belief content. So the property of having a certain belief content like the believing the content snow is white or believing that um, grass is green. So th those are the contents of our beliefs. Um, NP, I'll probably call them NP properties. So um, NP stands for neuro neurophysiological properties. So that's the property of having neurons in a certain state or undergoing certain events or it probably includes a little more than that, um, being arranged in certain ways or being related to each other certain ways. Uh, so this is going to be properties related to uh, neurons firing in our brains. Okay. Okay. Reductive materialism is going to be the view, is the view that mental properties just are physical properties. And non-reductive materialism is the view that mental properties are not identical to, but are completely determined by physical properties. So the, the difference between reductive materialism and non-reductive materialism is, is very slight, but they're both just ways of trying to take those um, mental properties up, up there. Sorry, I can't. Okay, mental properties yeah. <laughs> up there. And then, uh, the con and then showing how they relate to content properties and NP properties. So reductive mater materialism will say those content properties reduce to the new NP properties. And then non-reductive materialism will say they don't, they're not reduced to, they're not just the same thing as the physical properties or the NP properties, but uh, they're, at least determined by that. So that's mm -hmm. the just. Okay. And again, you have to understand these terms to even understand planning as defense of premise one. So now we get into the actual uh, defense itself. Okay. All right. So um, I thought this little diagram would be helpful, which Jordan, thanks for making it a lot prettier than my Microsoft Word version. <laughs> um, yeah. So why I think that it's unlikely that our faculties will be reliable given naturalism and evolution. Well, supposing naturalism is true, planning our argues, then materialism is probably true. It's very unlikely that we would have souls or like spirits or something like that. Um, so if naturalism is true, materialism is probably true. Then materialism is probably true. Then our mental properties will probably just be, either be our physical properties in the case of reductive materialism, or uh, they'll be determined solely by our, um, physical properties. So uh, given reductive materialism, just reading the chart, belief that P just is an NP property, 
And then non-reductive materialism, belief that P is completely determined by an NP property. So it's good to just have that those options. Okay, and then let's go to the next slide. Right, so now you pick one of the options on the last slide, like say you'd pick non-reductive materialism. Oh. What follows from that, according to Planiga? Okay, so here I've been kind of talking, but I'm going to read from my notes because here it's really important to get the, the argument right. So suppose non-reductive materialism is true. Then beliefs and the cognitive faculties that produce those beliefs, they're going to be selected for because of their adaptive NP properties, because, the, because of the NP properties of the beliefs. And that's because it's the NP properties that are doing the work of producing our adaptive behavior, which will get us to you know, um, act in ways that help us reproduce and survive and so forth. Okay. Uh, beliefs won't be selected for because of their content properties or whether the belief is true or whether the cognitive faculties producing the beliefs are producing true beliefs. So uh, it's not likely that then that evolution would select for cognitive faculties that are reliable or produce tr mostly true beliefs given naturalism and non-reductive materialism. Um, okay, so uh, it'll be good to kind of think of an example to help illustrate this and I think you even had a drawing for it. Did you have a drawing for this? Was this the frog? No, no, that's not the frog. It's a worm. I don't have a worm. You don't have a worm. Okay. I only have the frog. <laughs> okay. We'll have a frog later for those who are interested in frogs. Okay. So um, it's hard to know what the what the most primitive creature would be that has a belief, but we could have pick, pick a bug or maybe a rodent. Uh, I'll pick a planning I use as a worm, a, a C. elegans, a type of little worm. Um, so suppose a worm forms a belief in response to a predator that's chasing after the worm, and then the worm moves away from the predator. This is probably not the best reason, example, but anyway, because I don't think worms really do this, but just suppose. Okay. It'll be the NP properties of the belief, the neurophysiological properties of the belief, that get the worm's body moving away from the predator. Okay, so on non-reductive materialism, it will be the NP properties doing all the work and the content properties are gonna be irrelevant to behavior. And hence, it'll be irrelevant whether those content, whether those contents are true. Okay, so uh, Planning has this quote, it's, I mean, why think that it would be, we have no reason to think that whatever beliefs this worm is forming, that there would be true beliefs rather than false beliefs, or even that the beliefs would be about the predator or anything in the environment in particular, okay? So as long as the NP properties are adaptive, helpful for survival reproduction, that's what matters for survival, not whether the belief has a true content. Okay, so, so, and if that's all the case, then it seems like evolution would not select for reliable faculties. There's the explanation. Okay, let me make sure I'm getting the rough idea right so when we um when we pick say we're supposing non-reductive materialism is the case uh -huh. um the first thing planning wants to say there is that what natural selection is going to select for or favor uh in the evolutionary process is neurophysiological properties and by that we mean neurons firing yeah. certain certain like you know events huh. in the brain like yeah. neurons moving around and things like that those types of events um natural selection is going to select for you know certain events like that to happen in your brain right. Right. and it doesn't it's not selecting based on the content uh -huh. just where those neurons are at how they're firing that sort of thing that's but right. then if that's the case then our the beliefs produced by our faculties are not selected for because they're true. That's right. And if they're not selected for because they're true, then evolution isn't likely to select for reliable faculties. That's right. Yep. And um, yeah, you, we could talk about the beliefs being selected for directly or the cognitive faculties producing those beliefs. Either way, it's not going to be because those faculties are producing true beliefs. That's the, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But Good summary, uh -huh. suppose, that reductive materialism is true. Uh huh. What happens then? Yeah. So what? It's interesting. So this is actually the new part of EAAN. So what we've covered so far—that was all in the 2002. 
you can even kind of find it in the 1993 version, but um, in the 2011 in this book, um, planning it spends a little bit of time on the reductive materialism part. I think he thought that in earlier times, he thought reductive materialism wasn't as popular, but but now in this version, he spent some time on it. So um, yeah, so what he's going to say is pretty similar. So suppose reductive materialism is true, then beliefs and the faculties producing the beliefs will be selected for because of their NP properties. Okay, but that's what we that's what, similar to what we just talked about. Now, on this view, the content properties just are the NP properties. That's why it's reductive materialism. Content properties reduced to NP properties. So because of that, beliefs will be the beliefs will be selected for because of their content properties. Okay, um, that's right. But the the beliefs and the faculties that produce them, they still won't be selected for because they have true contents. Okay, so they, you might actually be getting beliefs selected for because of the contents, um, because contents just are NP properties, but it won't be because they're true contents. And this, and we could use the same example with the worm earlier. It might be that the, um, the, the worm has NP properties that cause behavior, and that NP property just is a content property, but whether that belief is a true belief or a false belief won't be relevant to its, whether it's able to survive and reproduce and so forth. So if that's all true, then it seems that evolution, it seems to follow that evolution wouldn't select for reliable faculties, even if reductive materialism is true. Okay, so I want to do my little summary here, make sure I'm following. So, because we got a couple people in the live chat that it seems like um, maybe the order of explanation, or, or better yet, um, which properties depend on other properties? People are questioning that in the live chat. So some people are like, well, what if the neuro neurophysiological properties depend on or or like are caused by, influenced by something like that, the content properties and not oh. the other way around? It's not. Um, uh, so in other words, the content yeah. has some type of influence on the neurophysiological properties. What if that's the yeah. case? Yeah, that, so that seems to the... fall in line with with this, because either way, whether they're um, as long as the content is either causing the neurophysiological properties or are just identical to either way the content is playing an important role in this story uh, um, on, at this point in the argument yeah so at this point in the argument we're talking about reductive materialism on reductive materialism content properties just are np properties yeah so they reduce to so then it can't be that content properties cause the neurophysiological properties um, Right, so, but wouldn't so that, that function the same way uh -huh. on uh, on the like reductive materialism? Mm -hmm. uh, sir, uh, in terms of the argument, functions pretty much the same way as if someone said uh, the the content properties are causing the neuro the neurophysiological properties. I get that those are different because one person saying they're identical and the other one saying no, 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 they're not identical. But the point is. Is, is selection like selecting for content or not? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a little thrown off by this idea that content properties could cause and determine neurophysiological properties on a materialist view. So that's a little bit, actually I'm having a hard time kind of grasping that option. Uh, I mean, you might, um, because I and mean, even on non-reductive materialism, where the content properties are distinct from the neurophysiological properties, it's um, it's still the neurophysiological properties that are determining or causing the 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 um, the content properties. Um, so I don't know. I, I guess I would just say it, it strikes me that um, that just wouldn't be a materialist option. Um, Okay. Now, I think you're wanting to say, well, yeah, but couldn't you still get the argument to work on that option? And I'm not sure, actually. I'd have to think about that. I, I'm not sure if I'm grasping it all correctly. Mm -hmm. I guess on both stories, whether it's reduct whether it's this reductive story or the other one I just described where content causes the neurophysiological properties, either way, content matters in the story. Ah, um, I think that would right, be right in the story you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So I wonder if what goes for the reductive materialist 
Kate story could bleed over into the other one. Um, uh, the view you're talking about? Yeah, where content um, causes neurophysiological problems. Okay, so on on the okay, this is a little bit of a tangent, but uh, um, on the view you're talking about. Where are the content properties coming from? So I could understand if this were a dualist view where you have like a soul that has just like um, various belief contents and that may like cause stuff in your, in the, um, in your neurons, cause neurons to fire. Then I could get that. Uh, it's hard for me to understand this in a physicalist view where are these neurophysiological properties, um, if, if they're not determined by or reduced to, the neurophysiological properties. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I might just be repeating myself. I don't see how it's materialist. Yeah, I, I get your point. That okay. that kind of story seems to cut against this definition of naturalism that we started with. Because mm -hmm. we ruled out, we're like, things like spirits, souls, um, that yeah. kind of stuff just doesn't exist on this view. Right. But, uh, um yeah, so now going to the next point, though, if we were to say neurophysical content property, let's just assume dualism, but naturalism, uh, and you still had belief contents causing um, neurophysiological properties, you would still want a story, and this is kind of that third step right there, um, where it's because the beliefs are true that you're getting adaptive behavior. Mm -hmm. And you might, I'm not sure if you would get that even with a dualist view, if you don't have any guidance. That's what, that's what I was kind of getting at was, okay, so suppose content matters. Well, what doesn't matter about the content, at least it seems, is whether it's true or false. As long as you get um, uh -huh. a certain kind of neurophysiological property at yeah. the end, that's, that's going to be selected for. I, I think that's, I think that's right. And I think I was slow to get your point, but I think I'm getting a little more clearly now. Yeah. I think that's right. Okay. I, I'm sure I wasn't saying it very clearly, but uh, yeah. So sticking with what's on the slide, this is my okay. yeah. basic summary. The neurophysiological properties on this view, reductive materialism are just identical to the content properties. Mm -hmm. um, and say, yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, it, that doesn't mean that um, the true content will, is what's going to be selected for. Right. Um it could be that the false content is favorable, like for your survival. Uh, and so then it doesn't look like uh, natural selection is selecting for true content properties. So then it's, it's not, it, yeah. So then it's not, evolution is not selecting for reliable faculties. That's right. Yep. There we go. Okay, that's my summary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that gets it right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, that's the defense of premise one. Uh huh. But someone may still think, think, <laughs> um, you know, it it still seems like having faculties that produce true beliefs are more likely uh -huh. to make a creature survive, right? Doesn't that just seem to be the yeah. case? So, how does planning a respond to this? Yeah. And when you have the right sort of like hookup that like between our mind and the world that we do in the actual world, it's very natural to think that. Um, so it's, um, so planning, it makes a distinction that I, I think will help understand the argument. And he distinguish, this isn't just him by the way, um, but he distinguishes between indicators and belief content. Or belief content is just the content of belief, what we were just talking about. Um, indicators are neural structures that are, kind of correlate with the external world and regular ways and they're causally um relevant to behavior okay so um now it's easy tempting to think that indicators uh, would just be, be beliefs and belief contents but it's useful to think how they're different so planning a uses the example of a frog that uh, um, it'll automatically flick a fly and like catch the fly like in this nice picture you have so the Fly is going by, uh, frog sees the fly. Because it sees the fly, there's a signal sent to its brain. Okay. The brain indicates the presence of the fly. And then the brain sends a signal to the muscles in the tongue to automatically flick and catch the fly. So it can enjoy its fly meal. Sounds very yummy. Okay, so so far so good. But planning his point is that nowhere in this process does 
there have to be a belief that there's a fly, like a belief content that there's a fly. So the frog can have sensors, indicators, corresponding behaviors, but you don't need a true belief in the process. Um, here's my own example that we can kind of see from the inside. Uh, so this happened. This has happened to me before. Um, suppose your hand touches a hot stove and you like quickly pull it away. Um, the reason this happens is because there's sensors in our hand that will immediately send signals to our brain when we've talk, touched an extremely hot object. Um, the brain will automatically send a signal to my muscles to pull my hand away. But notice in this process, uh, nowhere is there really a belief involved. Okay, um, so the fact that there's indicators, kind of like contents that kind of move our bodies in the right place, doesn't doesn't uh, at all imply that there's going to be beliefs or beliefs that are true or more likely to be true uh, in this story. So, so the so the idea is this: just stepping back. If materialism is true, then there's no to think, reason to think that belief contents, which are determined by or reducible to NP properties, there's no reason to think that belief contents um, being true or being true belief contents will contribute to adaptive behavior. So, accurate indicators could do that, but Accurate indicators don't imply the presence of true beliefs. So that that's the idea there. Okay. All right. So let's keep pressing ahead. We're doing pretty good on time here. Okay. Um, okay. Let's turn to a defense of premise two now. Okay. And this and is, actually, um, let me go back. And... Yeah, can I say one more thing about the previous slide? Um, yes. Or just about premise one. Um, you might think, well, maybe we just ha need the right theory of belief from the philosophy of mind to get this going. And um, I think that is the place to attack this argument. And that's the place where I would be most open to criticism. Uh, in 2011, planning a, has a paper where he kind of responds to some of the, mo like many of the most popular theories of belief by Ruth Milliken, and Fred Dretzky, Jerry Fodor. And he kind of examines whether their theories of belief could play the role that um, a naturalist might need to def uh, respond to planning his argument. And, uh, he does, a, I think, a pretty good job arguing that they don't work. Um, but uh, we can't really go into that here, but just noting that to the viewers. Yeah. Yeah. So let me go back to the main argument really quickly. Uh, so that was the defense of premise one, that the probability uh -huh. that our cognitive faculties are reliable given naturalism and evolution is low. Uh -huh. Now we turn to premise two. Anyone who accepts or believes uh, that naturalism and evolution are true and sees that the probability that our cognitive faculties are reliable given naturalism and evolution is low has a defeater for R, that their cognitive wow. faculties are reliable. That's yeah. a mouthful, but <laughs> <laughs> hopefully people are getting the idea. How do uh, how does planning a defend premise yeah. two? And you can see like what justifies using variables, I guess, um, so that we don't right. have to say the whole sentence every time. Yeah, I think there's a it's that's the next slide way up or way up. Yeah, let me um, go back here. Yeah. Okay, so um right, so okay. If you come to think that given certain things you believe that it's likely or very unlikely that your faculties are reliable then that does seem to give you a defeater for thinking your faculties are reliable. And uh, planning, it gives the XX pill case. Um, and uh, here's the case. Uh, you learn that a pill called XX uh, destroys the cognitive reliability of 95% of those who ingest it. So uh, you've even seen experiments where people take the pill and they're just like hallucinating it all over the place. You take the pill. And so you come to believe that you've ingested XX, and the probability that your faculties are reliable, given that you've ingested XX, is low. Okay. In this case, in the XX pill case, it really does seem like you have a defeater for R. You have a reason to think that your faculties are likely not reliable. Okay, And if it's true in the XX pill case, planning of things, it's kind of like that for the naturalist who believes that the probability of R given enemy is low. Um, and so it's pretty, this is a much more straightforward uh, line of reasoning than the uh, premise one. Um, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense, Jordan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we had talked about this several months ago. Uh -huh. If I 
came to really believe like I've <laughs> taken this pill that yeah. uh, 95% of those who ingest it, their cognitive faculties aren't reliable anymore. Uh, or yeah, it's very, it's very unlikely their cognitive faculties are reliable. Yeah, yeah. If I came to think I took that pill, then now I've, I'm, I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it seems like I've got this kind of global defeat that yeah. you're talking about. You're epi- you're epistemically screwed. That's the, uh, that's the name I call for. I caught it in the paper. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So did you want to say anything else in defensive two here? Um, no, I mean, there's an objection we might go over later, but, uh, uh but right, I think right. that's just like the initial support for it. Right. Okay. So I think the, we'll go to the next slide here. Uh, so we've, we've given a defense of premise one and two, three and four. What do you want to say about those? They're pretty quick. Yeah, not a lot. I mean, we can just kind of look through them. I mean, premise three, once you have a defeater for R, anyone has a defeater for R has a defeater for any other belief she thinks he has, she has, including an any itself. And that's reasonable because if you, if you doubt, have a lot of doubt that your faculties are reliable, then you shouldn't really trust any of the beliefs that are coming out of your faculties. That's basically what premise three is saying, including your belief in naturalism and evolution. And then premise four is saying, and once you think NNE has a defeater, then it would follow that NNE is self-defeating and can't rationally be accepted. And this really, and so therefore conclusion, NNE, naturalism, evolution can't rationally be accepted. Um, now, this really should be just for the naturalists who have to kind of like undergone this reasoning with planning uh, um, through these premises. Uh, they're the ones who get self-defeat. Um, not just any old naturalist, but the naturalist who's considered uh, planning his argument. Yeah. All right. Then now it's time for objections, yeah. <laughs> which I think a lot of people in the live chat want to see. So we're going to go over at least two and then we're going to go to Q&A. So if you're already you've you've got some questions you can put them in the live chat just put the word question at the beginning okay so we're going to spend a few minutes unpacking a couple of objections and then go to your questions all right the first objection this is an objection that i've heard um some people on facebook raise and also i've i've heard in a little video clip on youtube uh tim mcgrew raised this objection and that is basically it looks like this argument depends on a controversial position uh, view in oh. epistemology called externalism. Uh, and if you're not an externalist, if you're an internalist, then that's an, that gives you a reason, you know, a way out of the argument. So why don't you explain the difference between internalism and externalism first, and then, you know, oh. respond to this objection. Does this argument depend on externalism? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked because we got I got this slide ready, which you prepared. So thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I've seen this in a random place on Facebook, too, where somebody I think was on Facebook or somewhere where somebody said, well, it depends on whether externalism is true. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's good that we're talking about this. So there's a few ways internalism and externalism are defined in the epistemological literature. And here's one common way. Uh, internalism, what you're justified or rational in believing, uh, directly depends solely on what's in your mind. Okay, so um, another way to think of it is take anybody who's a mental duplicate of you. They all have all the same sensations, the way things appear to them, the way things seem to, uh, to them. Uh, they'll be just as justified in believing whatever they believe as whatever you believe. Uh, externalism is the view that what you're justified in believing does not directly depend solely on what's going on in your mind. Okay, so some externalists will say that what you're justified in believing will also depend on other things like uh, whether your belief is formed by a reliable process or by a properly functioning uh, cognitive faculties. And that's going to be playing in this view. Now, whether it's like whether your beliefs and sensations and feelings, whether or your other mental properties, whether they're formed by properly functioning mechanisms or reliable faculties, notice that's kind of outside of your mind. And that's kind of outside of your first person point of view. And externalists want to say that sort of thing matters for whether your just belief is justified. So um, 
Yeah. So internalists deny that. Internalists will deny that whether your belief is formed by a reliable process or properly functioning faculties is relevant to whether a belief is justified. Okay. So here would be an objection someone could give. Here's the objection. Objection. EAAN concludes that naturalists have unjustified beliefs because their beliefs are not formed by reliable faculties. Whether a belief is formed by reliable faculties, that's an external factor, something outside or external to the mind. So EAAN assumes that externalism is true and internalists should not be, so internalists should not uh, be fine planning as argument convincing. Okay, so here's the response. Um, I think there's uh, a confusion here and we need to distinguish between two claims. Claim one is the claim that the, is this, the naturalist faculties are unreliable. That's one claim. And claim two is that naturalists have a reason to think their faculties are unreliable. Okay. Now it's important to note that EAAN is only making claim two. Okay, it's making the second claim, not the first claim. If it was making the first claim, then it would be assuming externalism. But uh, since it's only making the second claim, it's not assuming externalism. So, and both internalists and externalists worry about defeaters having reasons to think that your beliefs were formed unreliably. Um, they both think that those are relevant to whether beliefs are justified. So um, this objection kind of just misunderstands what the argument is saying. It's not make, saying claim two, it's saying claim one. Is that, is that clear? Make sense? Yeah, I want to make sure I, I understand uh, this much. So like um, the second claim for an internalist, uh, at least if they buy planning as arguments, argument, right, right, yeah, right, yeah, you know, we're yeah. assuming that they agree. But if those mm -hmm. work, like they're like, yeah, yeah, the probability of our cognitive factors being reliable would be low given naturalism evolution. Okay, yeah. if they're buying that. um then now they have a reason that's like, that would be, um, that would be a defeater. Right. And they uh, internalists there. It's not like they're like, Oh yeah. Defeaters. They're, yeah. they're no good. Like they have a defeater now. Right. Um, and in fact, internalists should care about this even more because it's a reason within their mental grasp. Uh, so right that's my point is like right, yeah so even even though the story involves um how you came to uh have the cognitive faculties you have like that's right. even though the story involves these kind of like external things yeah that doesn't matter when all your when all you're arguing is for claim two right when no. when you're just trying to show like but wait this story if true gives us a reason to think that our faculties are unreliable yeah and then that's all we that's all the defeater it takes yeah so it's a little bit mind-boggling if anything internalists should be more worried about this because it's your belief that's something internal your belief about how your cognitive faculties came about given naturalism and evolution that should be worrying um, and that's an internal thing the fact that you believe it if anything there's a case to be made that some externalists won't care about this but in general, most externalists do care about avoiding defeaters. So, um, yeah, that's right. All right. Um, let's go on to the next objection. And okay. this was the the one that – this was interesting, uh, uh -huh. that the argument, the evolutionary argument against naturalism itself is self-defeating. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So um, – Right. Is that a problem for EAAN, the fact that it's self-defeating? Well, um, so I don't know if you remember, Jordan, we talked about this a bit, I think, uh, when we met in person last fall. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, let's look at the self-defeating argument. What is a self-defeating argument? A self-defeating argument for S uh, is one where by believing its conclusion, S is no longer justified in believing at least one of its premises. Okay. And you might think that EAAN is self-defeating uh, for this reason. Okay. So suppose the naturalist does come to believe he has a defeater for R and hence has a defeater for all of his beliefs. If the naturalist agrees with that, then they'll also have a defeater for their belief in the premises of EAAN. 
But that means they're not really justified in believing in the premises of EAAN anymore. And so it looks like EAAN is self-defeating. Okay, so if you really have a defeater for all your beliefs, you have a defeater for the belief in the premises of EAAN. So now EAAN, it looks like it's self-defeating. Okay, so that's the objection. Uh, I guess the slide, people can see the answer. My reply to the uh, objection all at once. Um, so this is some stuff I, I emphasize in this new paper I have coming out. And it's this slogan, uh, put up with it. I'm, I'm glad you put it in a sign, <laughs> Jordan. Very nicely <laughs> done. Um, Self-defeating arguments can defeat. Okay. And the best way to see that is to recall that XX pill case we talked about uh, like 10 minutes ago or whatever. Um, suppose you believe that you took the XX pill, XX pill and you believe that it's unlikely that your faculties are reliable. That's going to also give you a defeater for all your beliefs including your belief that you took the XX pill. Okay. So you now think, oh, well, that's a self-defeating reasoning. So I don't have to worry about the fact that I believe that I took the XX pill. I no longer have a defeater for R. Um, surely not, right? It, it seems like you would still have a defeater for R in the XX pill case. Um, nobody should think, ah, well, I got a defeater for all my beliefs, so I'm just scot-free. I don't have to pay attention to this argument. Okay. So what you really have here is what I'm calling a global defeater. So a global defeater is a defeater for all your beliefs. Um, and uh, yeah, once you get one of these, as I mentioned before, you're epistemically screwed. And really, um, it, you're stuck. Uh, what I say there in that little thought bubble there in the slide, slide is that uh, you can't reason your way out of global defeaters because you have nothing to work with anymore. Um, you have no justified beliefs by which to argue your way out of a global defeater. It really sucks. Like in the paper, I try to search for ways that one might try to get out and they all fail. So, um, yeah. Yep. All right. So we're at like the 45 minute mark. Let's uh -huh. try, if you're cool with it, let's try to throw in that third objection, the conditionalized one. Uh -huh. Is that cool? Uh, yeah, that's going to take a bit more time, but hmm, let's, okay. yeah, what do you think? I'll tell you that I'll, I'll do this. We'll just go to Q and A and if somebody okay. wants to ask about that one, they, they're welcome yeah. to. Yeah. The conditionalization okay. problem. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we got a few questions that came in, but before I go to those, this was, let me go back to full screen. This was, this made me laugh. So River, Rivertown cards sent in a $20 super chat, super generous. Thank you. Rivertown cards. And he said, the catalog of videos you're building is quite the accomplishment. So many gifted minds all in one place. Your treasures are stored in heaven where neither moth or rust destroy, but here's 20 of the corruptible stuff. I thought that was pretty funny. Okay, thank you, Rivertown Cards. Yeah, that's very generous. Yeah, very generous. Okay, so um, let's go to Matthias... I think maybe Matthias uh, Dovni Moon. If the naturalist holds a concept of truth other than the correspondence one, like Putnam's internal realism, does the evolutionary argument against naturalism still work against him? Greetings from Brazil. Um. Okay, I'm going to be honest from the start that I actually don't know which... Uh, what sort of concept that Matthias is talking about or Putnam's internal realism. So uh, that might, um, I could speculate and talk about that, but I'd have to start by just being honest and saying, I'm not sure what that, that is. Um, yeah. I mean, we could try Jordan, to, to I guess that. I'm to, so I don't know what Putnam's internal realism is talking yeah. about, but let's, let's assume at least this much. It sounds like he's saying, if you have some alternative concept of truth besides the correspondence theory of truth, you know, is that going to, is the evolutionary argument against naturalism still going to work? Yeah. And I guess it's going to depend on what the other concept of truth is. But I mean, if all we need is, let's say for my belief that there is a book to be true, there, there, there has to be this book. Um, I mean, I don't know if that commits me to a correspondence theory of truth, but um, yeah, sorry. I, I had to just say, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking of possible answers I can give, but I don't think they would be very helpful. So, okay. 
Um, yeah, I'm not, yeah, and I'm not sure if I am, if or I or planning are assuming any specific theory of truth. So, um, yeah, maybe if Matthias, if you could say a little bit more about what the um, the concept of truth is, and maybe which premise it should make us want wanted to to deny, then maybe that would help. He um, did follow up. He just he said, "Does the argument presuppose a correspondence theory of truth?" I guess that's yeah. what he was getting at. Um, I see. Yeah, I'm not sure if it does actually. Um, yeah, I don't see it like specifically assumed as a premise. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll just have to leave it at that. I, I don't. I can't think of anything helpful to say. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so next one, Theist Brooks asked. Dr. Moon, do you think that if the probability of our cognitive faculties being reliable is inscrutable, or yeah, do you think the probability of our cognitive faculties, of course, given naturalism and evolution, uh, is inscrutable? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it seems like the it argument still so. worked then. Yeah, does it still work then? And that's useful to note because in the first two books, uh, Planningo was saying that it would work even if it were inscrutable. And the more recent incarnations of his book, or the argument in that book, uh, he only goes with the low probability. Um, I'm inclined to think that I, I actually it depends on the time of the week. But I think for now, like for now, I'll just say yeah, I'm inclined to think that it does. I was talking about this with Kerry Hendricks. Um, I so let's say. Uh, um, you are going, somebody's going to say, hey, you're going to take, here's this pill, okay, and but it's a totally inscrutable probability that it's going to render your cognitive faculties unreliable, okay, and uh, you don't know whether it's high probability, you know, you don't know whether it's a low probability or even a medium probability, you don't even know the probability at all, okay, and you take the pill, it does seem like you have a, uh, a defeater for believing your cognitive faculties are reliable now. Um, thinking about pills that uh, uh, mess with our, all of our faculties can be a little worrisome. So let's say um, you meet a stranger and you're wondering where the direction of a certain building is. Okay. And then afterward, you wonder, your, somebody tells you, by the way, there is a completely inscrutable probability that that person was a reliable testifier. Could have been a high probability, could have been low probability, could have been medium probability. But it is ins completely inscrutable. If I realize that about that testifier, then it does seem like I would have a defeater for any of this testimony. And so it seems like that would also apply in the EAAN case. So that's what I'm inclined to say right now, but sometimes I move the other way. So I'll just leave it at that. All right. Uh, Kedrick Kwan sent in a $10 super chat. Thank you so much, Kedrick. And he asked the difficult question, yeah. what is the conditional objection, a.k.a. objection three? Uh-huh. Yeah. So um, it, it's – okay. Thanks, Kedrick or Kedrick. Um, uh, thanks for that. And I think – okay, so it's actually called the conditionalization problem. And if we don't have too many other questions in the queue, maybe we could just go through that slide. Uh, we've got – let's see. Let me count. We've got one, two, three. Three more after this. Uh, okay, notice that Kedrick or Kedrick did not tell me to reply to the conditionalization. <laughs> so, uh, I'll just explain it really quickly then. Um, I think I can explain it. Uh, relatively. He's he's a patron, so we could always um, yeah. copy and paste what your response is in uh, our patron-only Facebook group. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I can still explain it pretty quickly. And, okay, yeah. Um, it might be a service to other people, and to him, just to hear it explained to you. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, do you still have that slide? Uh, yeah, let me switch over. Okay. And see. here's objection three. Let me check my notes. Okay. The conditionalization problem. All right. Okay. So the conditionalization problem is an objection to premise two. Uh, so premise two says anyone who accepts or believes NNE and sees that probably argument NNE is low has a defeater for R. Okay. Now, very early on, some people were saying, well, you know, conditionalized just on NNE, R is improbable, but maybe there are other things the naturalist believes that can raise the probability of R. 
Okay, so when I'm considering the probability of some event having happened, let's say or some proposition being true, I don't want to just conditionalize on like certain bits of information. I want to conditionalize on like all the relevant information um, and then be able to judge whether the probability of that proposition or that uh, is, is true or whether that event occurred or something like that. And so the, so the naturalists could say there's some proposition B that they believe um, which is probably argument enemy is high, and that'll deflect the defeater. It'll block defeat from ever happening. That's a defeater deflector that blocks defeat. <clears throat> now, um, early uh, criticizers of uh, EAN were people like Carl Janay, and Carl Janay said, "Why can't B the B the defeater deflect the defeater deflector? Why can't B be?" Uh, R itself. So is that the last slide you have there, Jordan? This is the last one, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so here's something most of us take ourselves to know to be true, that our faculties are reliable. I mean, that's something we in general take ourselves to know. Okay. So what's the probability of R given N and E and R? Well, that's one, right? That's extremely yeah. high. And so maybe R itself can be the defeater deflector. Um, okay. And so that's the objection. And planning it has a pretty convincing response that the objection, as it stands, it's not convincing. Um, notice you could use this in the XX pill case. So what's the probability of R given that I took XX pill? Okay, uh, That's low. It seems to give me a defeater for R. Now, somebody who wants to use this sort of objection could be just be like, well, that's true, but the probability of R given I took XX and R well, that's really high, right? If you can conditionalize on R itself. Yeah. Um, and planning is like, come on, that seems wrong. Okay. It seems like you shouldn't be able to conditionalize on R itself. Okay. Um, so here's the conditionalization problem. It's actually a question. Uh, it seems like you shouldn't be allowed to uh, conditionalize on R, but it seems like maybe you should be able to let conditionalize on other stuff. And so the question is, which propositions are the ones that are permissible to conditionalize on um, to determine whether we get a defeater for R. That's the conditionalization problem or the conditionalization question. And Planning says uh, he could, didn't have like a rigorous solution to this. Um, in my paper, I try to give a solution to this. So um, uh, yeah, they can, I mean, the paper link is in the description. So, uh, but that's kind of like to whet appetites maybe. Yeah, and you cover way more objections in the than what we have time to discuss here in the paper. Yeah, yeah. I, I, just to plug the paper, I uh, cover objections by Stephen Law, Eric Wielenberg, Michael Bergman, uh, Perry Hendricks, and Tina Anderson. So there's a lot in there. Uh, yeah, but some of them they just take too, way too long. To talk right, about. right. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep moving here. Okay. Um, Th. Let me take down this scene. Uh -huh. Okay, TH asked, what do you say about Richard Swinburne's objections oh. to planning his argument? Yeah, I have to apologize. Um, this is something that Jordan, you actually asked me about. And I remember reading, I remember it like being at the library and thumbing through this uh, like years ago. Um, but I actually forget Swinburne's objection. Like I don't remember. Um, I'm not even sure if I even read it back then. So um, it wasn't in the literature that I was reading. Uh, there's huge literature on this argument, actually. If anybody wants to like just give the objection briefly um, in the chat, I'd love to discuss it there. Um, I might just discuss it separately, but sadly, yeah. I can't say anything about that now. All right. Senior reformator. <laughs> uh, hi, Doc. Are there any books or resources to learn about the discussion of mind slash soul neuroscience and materialism that you'd recommend to mortals like me? Uh-huh. Uh, I'm also a mortal. Um, so a mortal. Um, yeah. So I think just a good philosophy of mind book, I would recommend. Um, a book that I think is very clearly and well written is a book by Jaguarn Kim. J-A-E-G-W-O-N Kim. So he's Korean like me. Uh, but yeah, I think that's one of the a real, really good uh, intro text in philosophy of mind that I would recommend. Excellent. Oh, I'd also recommend uh, watching some of Jordan's videos, interviews with Tomas Bogardis on uh, dualism and 
uh, philosophy of mind. So I thought those were very well done. Yeah. In one of those interviews, I think we called it exploring the mind body problem, maybe something uh -huh. like that. We give an overview of like the different views in the philosophy of mind. So that would be helpful. Yeah. I All really right. recommend that video. Very well done. And Bogardus is a very good philosopher. I really like Tomas. All right. And he's coming on really soon to talk about panpsychism. So I'm excited about that. All right. Uh, TH asked, could a bias towards simplicity solve the problem? A possible world where belief contents are randomly associated with neuro neurological states. And then he continues, uh, as Plantinga imagines, yeah. would seem less simple than one where there are correlations. And yeah. he continues... Uh, if you change, for example, if you change a single atom in a neuron or something in the environment, you don't automatically generate a random belief. Good. Yeah. This is, I like this question from TH because I think that's the thing to explore more. Uh, and that's going to be the question, like, how do we make this connection between belief and belief contents and then the neurophysiological states that either they're identical to or that they are determined by? Um yeah, so and the, so TH is suggesting, well, maybe if we go simpler, uh, then that would help the naturalist. So that's an interesting suggestion. Um, so first of all, I want to say, I think this is what I just said. It's a good place to explore. And um, now I'm not sure if simpler would actually help um, the naturalist. I mean, it could be that the beliefs uh, that supervene on these neuronal states, they could be simple, they could be complex. Uh, they might be random. Uh, and I think Plantinga's point is just whether they're simpler or more complex. I, here's what I would say right now. Why would that be biased toward true belief? And as far as I can tell, given naturalism and uh, these two options that Plantinga is considering, um, I don't see why like simpler would make the beliefs more likely to be true um, or the beliefs have true contents. So um, I guess that's my quick thought there. I, I was taking the questioner to be asking um, what would be simpler? Like, I guess the way the questioner is thinking of simplicity is what's simpler yeah. is if the content and the neurophysiological state. Um, oh, I see. It's not all. It's, it's just a like it, the content is true. Like that's the simpler one rather than it leads to some false. There's a million ways it could go wrong. Yeah. The, the, the content could be false. Is it, do, do you, am I making sense? Um, Oh, I thought you were going in a different direction. You, you might've understood. So go ahead. Well, I thought, I thought you were saying that it might be simpler if the belief content just always was the, um, the indicator. Like if they were yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's it seems like that's a simpler story. Uh huh. Yeah. So what Planet is going to say, and this is in his um, in his other paper where he spot where he responds to other theories of belief. So I would recommend that to Th if Th wants to look more carefully into that. Uh, it actually that theory and and false you mind planning is going to argue is going to fail for other reasons. Um, so the indicators are only going to give you matchups between like things in the environment corresponding correctly. Um, planning it gives a few difficulties for that view. It's not going to say anything about like uh, belief in necessary truths where there is no sort of like thing to correlate with in the environment. And what planning also adds is including belief in naturalism. Like naturalism isn't the sort of thing. It's the sort of thing that's either going to be necessarily true or necessarily false. Naturalism is not the sort of thing that's going to correlate with certain uh, neuronal states in your brain. Um, so if you take a belief, so then what planning ends up saying is on these theories of belief, it turns out that there's no such thing as belief in naturalism. And that's going to be a problem uh, for the naturalist um, who is supposed to believe in naturalism. So that's off the cuff. One of uh, planning is concerns about that theory of belief that they have a hard time with necessary truths. Maybe if you could actually narrow the uh, theory of belief so that it only says that about physical environment beliefs. And um, yeah, I mean, maybe you could. I guess I might say that might be simpler, but is that enough to give us a high probability? Like why I think that the belief content would be identical to the indicator content? Um, I mean, 
So simplicity gets you a little bit, but it might just not get us enough to have for us to think it's likely that the belief content would be identical to the indicator. Uh, okay. Um, that was a keep, good question, though. That was fun to talk about. Yeah. Let's keep going here. So truth is beautiful asked, does this argument work the same if someone holds to dualism, uh, idealism, or Thomism? Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's say it's not an evolution argument against naturalism but it's an evolutionary argument against a someone who is a dualist, a naturalist, except they believe in souls. So I think I might have a co colleague like that. Um, although, so this wouldn't be a naturalist. And actually, Jordan, um, I think that uh, take the dual, if we take the dualism option, that does kind of take us back to your earlier suggestion. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So now that I think more about it and thinking more about what you said earlier, I think that's right. Even if dualism is true, and so, and let's say dualist interactionism is true, so that there is a causal uh, interaction between uh, mental properties of our soul and then uh, neurophysiological properties, so there's this causal interaction, uh, you're still going to wonder why the neurophysiological properties is going to cause belief contents that are true and why it's going to be the true beliefs that are going to more likely cause uh, adaptive uh, behavior uh, rather than false beliefs. Um, and so I guess you're going to need something like, if planning is right, um, even with dualism, you might need uh, divine, some sort of divine guidance to get uh, the matchup right. Idealism and Thomism. I don't know. I, I feel like the Thomist is a theist. And so the Thomist could just say whatever planning is going to say, that God created humans in God's image. Right. And so we can have knowledge in something like the way God does. Although the Thomas is going to say it's, you know, only analogical, you know, it's like not quite like how God has knowledge, but uh, I think the, the Thomas has enough of a story there to not get a defeater for our idealist. Um, I guess it might depend on what type of idealism. So this is, this is real. I've never really thought about this. This is an interesting question. Um, the idealist. I guess it depends on what sort of idealism we're talking about. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, people I that may not know, sense. idealisms, everything's mental. Like, Sorry, yeah, I should explain really that. Good. Idealism, you know, everything's mental, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I probably should have explained all of these views uh, as I went through them. But yeah, I don't, I don't, depends on how the idealism is fleshed out. I would say that. Yeah. All right. Well, let's keep going. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Keto asks, why? Do the content props, is that propositions maybe or? Probably, yeah. Okay. Why do the content propositions need to be selected for because of their truth in order for the cognitive faculties to be reliable? Uh -huh. Isn't it enough that they supervene on things which are selected for? Oh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's a worthwhile question. That is worthwhile to ask. And I kind of thought about that. Is that a gap in planning as argument? Um, but if um, content properties, including like whether the contents are true, right? If, I mean, that's what you want. If they're not selected for be because they're true, I mean, then I guess I, I would want, wonder like why I think they would be true. Uh, I mean, it seems like there would be no reason. Um, they might supervene on other things, but the contents, but um, I guess, so uh, yeah, I guess I would just wonder like, what is the mechanism or story for how we would be getting reliable cognitive faculties or true beliefs, um, given everything planning has said about how neurophysiological properties are doing all the work and the content properties are just, um, well, it's not because they're true that they're selected for. So yeah. Uh, I guess I'm kind of repeating myself. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going here. Uh, Matthias asked, do you think evolutionary debunking arguments against moral realism that presuppose naturalism has a self-defeating argument? Yeah. Or maybe do I think that they are self-defeating arguments? And I think, I think if it's just a moral debunking argument, then I don't think it's self-defeating um, because uh, I mean, there's no, there's, um, yeah, I, I just don't see any reason to think that they're um, self-defeating. There might be, uh, so Katya Vavova has an argument that 
debunking arguments against normative realism uh, might be self-defeating because there's some sense of an epistemic ought that you're appealing to when you're using a debunking argument against um, when you did, when you against uh, normative properties. Where normative proper so sorry, there's moral properties and then normative properties is just any property having to do with ought, including epistemological ones like what you ought to believe or what your rational or what your evidence supports. Um, so I think evolutionary debunking arguments against normative realism might be self defeating because. Um, the argument itself depends on things about what you ought to believe. But I'm not sure if uh, evolutionary debunking arguments against normative realism would um, also be self-defeating. But here's a nice thing. As I've shown in my paper and in this interview, uh, self-defeating arguments can still serve as defeaters. Um, they shouldn't make the fact that they're self-defeating doesn't get the, the realist out off the hook. That's what I'm trying to argue. All right. Two more questions, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Miriam asked, hi, Dr. Moon. Does planning a think we are left with a certain choice to make in rejecting either naturalism, evolution, or both? Yeah. Uh, hey, Mir Miriam. Uh, good to hear from you, Miriam. Miriam is actually one of my students this semester, and she promised she would watch this, and she did. So uh, thanks, Miriam, and I appreciate your coming on. Okay, so uh, let's see. And rejecting other national evolution or both. Um, so here's the thing: planning it doesn't actually say. Like you would expect planning it to say. Like so, in response to all this, the naturalist should give up um, something. In terms of what he writes, all he writes is that the naturalist ends up with a, a global defeater and a defeater for naturalism. And if they're in that state, planning it does agree. Um, and this, I'm getting this from him that the the naturalist has a defeater for all their beliefs and they're stuck. Um, okay, that's what he says. Here's my speculation of what planning would probably think though. I think planning would probably want the naturalist to give up naturalism uh, as a response of considering all this, to his response to considering all this. I, I'm doubtful that planning would want the naturalist to give up evolution. And as far as I can tell, I'm pretty sure planning of believes in evolution um, from like many things he said, so. Um, all right uh we're gonna make this the last question and here we go dr moon do you think what do you think of the following argument one our cognitive faculties are generally unreliable two one is more expected given naturalism rather than theism yeah three so one is evidence for naturalism uh-huh um I think that premises one and two, uh, I think they give some support to the conclusion. So uh, that's one thing I think about this argument. Um, I think that premise one is false. Now, the word generally is a little bit vague. So I think that our cognitive faculties are generally reliable. Uh, Esau Ponce or Ponce, I don't know, um, thinks that our faculties are, are generally unreliable. Um, and I wonder why Esau, he thinks that. Um, Maybe because we do make a lot of cognitive errors. Like sometimes we misremember things. And, but uh, you got to compare that to just how many things we're getting right. So, you know, I might miscount something, like get one color wrong. But I mean, I'm right about the number of fingers I'm holding up, that I'm wearing glasses, that I have a nose, that, uh, that Jordan has a beard. I mean, just think about all the true beliefs we have relative to like how few are the false beliefs. So... Uh, th that's my reason for thinking like we're at least more than 50 percent right um uh, in our in our belief formation so um so i guess i would de deny premise one um premise two insofar as for this interview i am uh, um, i am defending planning as eaan uh for this interview i would have to accept two so um yeah there, that's what i'd say all right well we're gonna end it there thank you so much for taking an extra, you know, I was aiming for an hour and you took an extra 15 minutes with me to answer questions. So thanks. This was great. Yeah. Yeah. This was fun. It was, and those are uh, really good questions. So I appreciated uh, hearing from audience and thanks for having me on Jordan as well. So before you go, exciting news here. Um, if you are a patron or if you become a patron, then you can participate next week in a Q and a with Josh Rasmussen on his book, how reason can lead to God. 
He's going to be joining just my patrons and it's going to be a private Q and a with them. So by becoming a patron, you're really helping to support the work that I'm doing, helping me to continue making videos like this. So please consider becoming a patron. You also get early access to videos and lots of other things. So um, thank you again, Andrew. And uh, thank you to uh, the people that gave me the super chats tonight. I really appreciate that. And thanks everyone for watching. Um, we'll see you next time.